So this is test driven C++. Um, I am uh, Phil Nash, already been introduced, but uh, there's my, my Twitter handle as well. Um, in, in addition to that list of things that I seem to be involved with, I've just recently also got involved and co-hosted yet another podcast called uh, No Diagnostic Required, which I'm doing with uh, Anastasia Kazakova, my um, uh, colleague at JetBrains. So it's sort of a, a bit of a JetBrains focused um, podcast, but it's actually not JetBrains specific. It's about C++ news. So, uh, so watch out for that. It's going to be monthly. Um, so yeah, I'm developer advocate at JetBrains for the, the C++ tools. Not going to be talking about that tonight, but you will see uh, C line in my demos. So feel free to ask me about that afterwards, but I'm not going to make any more of it. Or maybe a little bit uh, as we go through. Okay, so test driven C++. C++. What, what are we actually talking about here? So probably recognize the, the allusion to um, TDD. What does TDD mean? And again, you probably know that it stands for test driven development. But if you've been around TDD people for a while, you may have also heard it described as test driven design. Same acronym, at least in English, but a slightly different focus. So I, I like to use both. I mean, TDD is uh, test driven development is more familiar. So I, I generally use that, but I actually prefer test driven design as an idea because as we're going to see, hopefully, although the, the, uh, the process of the development is being driven by tests, the thing you actually want, the end result, what you're actually aiming for is a better design driven from those tests. I think that's really what the focus should be. Uh, there's also some problems with the word test, uh, which is why we've had uh, other, other takes on it, like a behavior driven development. We're not going to get involved with that so much tonight, um, but yeah, I think emphasizing that word design is probably a bit more key. But that still doesn't really explain what it is and why it is, why it works, why I think it works. In fact, describing TDD, test driven development or design, is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. I can do it on a single slide. In fact, here it is. You may have seen something like this before, sometimes known as the, the TDD cycle or uh, the red green refactor cycle. Uh, we're going to go through this a bit and at the end of that you will sort of wake up like from the matrix and say i know tdd except really that's just the start just say that the process of tdd it's very easy to to learn but the art of tdd really requires uh, pre-existing experience you, really, you still have to know what you're doing it's not a, a silver bullet and also experience with tdd itself it's a different way of working if you're not familiar with it it takes practice to to use it effectively and there are parts to it that at first seem uh, trivial or, or almost silly and people skip those things and then they don't get the benefits so i'm going to try and tease out what some of those things are just to give you um, an opportunity to, uh, to to shortcut some of the bad experiences so we're gonna just have a little walk around this uh, this circle and uh, see what each of the steps mean Starting with the, the very first part, so the, the what we call the red stage um, of the red-green refactor is write a failing test. Uh, now I should you know, apologise just in case anybody watching uh, does have a uh, colour vision deficiency. Um, being able to distinguish red and green is not actually necessary for being able to follow this. It's just uh, part of the metaphor, but, uh, but I do apologise um, if, if that's the case. But we call this the red stage, writing a failing test. And there's a few bits about this that I want to emphasize before we even move on. And that's, first of all, this is where we start. This is really important. Most of the bits I'm going to talk about uh, on this slide are, um, should be taken uh, very strictly. If, you, if you're not following them, doesn't mean that what you're doing doesn't work or has no value, but it's not TDD. To be doing TDD, you have to be doing strictly these things. And that involves starting with a failing test. And we'll see a bit later how you can actually complement that with other forms of testing as well. But TDD tests start with a failing test. And to be the red phase, it has to be a failing test. So if you write a test and it passes first time, that's not part of the TDD cycle. Again, it doesn't mean it's not valuable. It does happen and we will see that happen. But it's important to recognize that being not part of the TDD cycle. And then finally, the word test. It's worth dwelling on that as well, because 
maybe uh, you think of that as just a, an assertion in a test framework, and very often it is. But really, the word test just means anything that's going to tell you when you've met some criteria, some requirement. Basically, you're encoding a requirement in code, and that will then automatically tell you whether you're meeting that requirement or not. So in the red stage, you're setting up as bar to reach. You're not reaching it yet, you know that by design, but it will tell you, it will sort of flip to green when, you, when it passes. That's really what a test is. So yeah, an assertion in the test framework does that, but so does a compiler error. If you write some code that doesn't compile, for example, because you're calling something or referring to something that doesn't exist yet, that's a failing test and that's part of TDD. You're, you're driving your development or your design from that failing test. You write the call first and then you write the code that makes it compile. That counts as a, a cycle around the TDD cycle. So don't get too hung up on the word test. There's, it's usually we're, we're talking about one of those two things, a compiler or a unit test, assertion failure, but it could be other things as well. So bear that in mind. Once you've got that fading test, we can move on to the green stage. So here, of course, is where you make the test pass by writing just the code to make the test pass. And again, I've highlighted some words. First of all, write just the code to make the test pass. Very subtle, very often overlooked. But it's actually quite important. What we're not trying to do here, and it's a counterintuitive, we're not trying to write the cleanest code the best code, the most well-factored code. In fact, you can be a bit of a hacker here, just the simplest or the quickest and easiest and dirtiest thing that will make the test pass. And in fact, there are some aspects to this where you're gonna write code that you know you're gonna have to change on the next step. In fact, that's actually part of the process. You just wanna make the test pass. And we're gonna expand on that a bit as we go through the example. Because there's a, there's a separate step that we'll come onto in a moment where you do concentrate on clean code, well-factored code, design principles, and so on. It's not here. Here, it's just the code to make the test pass. And yeah, we have to make the test pass. We can't exit this stage until we are all green. So if we break something else as well, we're still not green. All the tests must pass. Then, and only then, do we go on to the refactor stage. Now, I've colored this step as well. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, the red-green refactor cycle doesn't require refactor to have a colour, but just to complete the traffic light metaphor, I've made it sort of an orange or an amber colour, but there you go. But what is the refactor step? What does refactoring mean? So um, that's an, a big subject in its own right, but put simply, it's just changing the structure of the code or the design of the code without changing the functionality. But then we have to define what functionality means. And, and in this context, it means it passes the test or code that is tested. If it's not a test for a particular piece of functionality, in terms of our system, it doesn't really exist because there's no way that we can verify it if you're doing strict TDD. So what we really mean is <clears throat> we're changing the code without breaking the tests. Now, yeah, you may break them for a moment and then you can fix them again. It's also quite liberating because you can make um, sort of large, broad changes, knowing that if you do break things, you can roll back very quickly and easily to the last known good state. It's actually a really um, freeing way of, of working. And you don't have to actually do anything at the refactor step every time. So you may get here and realize, yeah, things, things are just fine as they are. I've got nice, clean, well-factored code this time around. Uh, or maybe, yeah, I, I know that this isn't perfect yet, but I know that the next time around the loop, I'm going to be making some other change in this same area and that's going to affect things. I'll hold off for now. And you can do that. But just a word of warning, especially when you're starting out, it's very easy to miss that refactor step for too long. And it doesn't take very long to end up with a big ball of mud, which is exactly what you were trying to avoid in the first place. So, yeah, you can skip the refactor step, but do it cautiously, knowingly and consciously. Don't fall into the trap of just forgetting to even consider it. I know I do from time to time. I come unstuck when I do. In a way, it's maybe one of the hardest parts of the art of TDD. So that's the refactor step. Um, there, there's a lot that I'm glossing over there. This is really where you need knowledge and experience of good design principles, 
which we're not going to get into in this talk. But if you think of, uh, in particular, things like separation of concerns, single responsibility, loose coupling, they're all sort of different facets of the same idea. Those sorts of things are the things that make code well factored and, and testable. And that, that's most of what the design principles center around. Uh, very commonly, you'll hear TDD practitioners talk about the solid principles. Um, I have some opinions on that. Uh, as it happens, this group has a resident expert on the solid principle, so do talk to Klaus. Uh, he's, he's done uh, talks on that, so I'll, I'll leave that to him for tonight. Um, so yeah, I'm glossing over the, the, the big part about knowing the design principles, but we'll talk about that actually later uh, when, when we come to talk about design pressure as well. So I'm going to move on to the, the fourth box here, which you don't normally see when you see the TDD cycle. It's usually just the red green refactor. I've added this are we done step as well, which we should move on to. And I like to separate this out because it's nice to have a, a dedicated place where you know you, you finish your refactoring before you write the next failing test. You actually ask what it is you have to do. Do you have to do anything else? But the reason it's nice to separate this out is because when we're not using TDD or some sort of defined process like this, it's very easy to just get lost in the code, lost in the implementation, and to think, oh yeah, that would be good to do, or I'll, I'll do this next, or maybe you, you forget what you, you were meant to be doing. Because when you've got that sort of implementators, sorry, implementers mindset, we'll talk about this more a bit later, it's very easy to just lose track of the requirements because it's a different type of thinking. So having a separate step gives us permission to sort of step back and say, right, Everything's done, all the tests are passing, code is nice and clean. Now, is there something else I need to do? And if so, I'll write the next failing test. Otherwise, well, we can end here. Simple, but really powerful and freeing. So that's the basic run through of Red Green Refactor, the TDD cycle, just a, the classic explanation. And that will get you started, get you a long way, but when you actually start practicing it, that's when all the little nuances and um, things that you hadn't really considered or different ways of um, interpreting things really slow you down um, and maybe get you off track and, and you might even give up. So what we're going to do in a moment is work through an example and then we're going to come back and consider this cycle again. But um, at this point, it might be a good point just to see if anybody has any questions on that sort of high level theory before we go down a level. Um, exactly, There's, there are two questions. Okay. The first one is um, just a code to pass, question mark. Is it okay to write horribly slow code? Doesn't meet performance criteria. More generally, how do performance requirements fit into test-driven development? That's a, that's a very good question. Of course, all the questions I'm sure are very good. Um, yes, yeah, so the first part, uh, is it okay to write very slow code? Uh, yes, because we're not trying to write the final code here. If performance is a big thing that you're you're trying to incorporate, this is not the time to do it. That would be part of the refactor stage because you're you're changing the code without changing the functionality, and performance is a non-functional requirement. So it's important, or it may be important, um, but you would you would do that in the refactor stage, and you would typically do that. Um, probably after you've implemented all the related functionality. Obviously that depends. And again, you do need to use your own um, experience and intuition because of course, you know, some things, if you leave them too long, it's, it's much harder to peel that back and, and then optimize it. So sometimes you do have to do things a bit more upfront. But what I do find is that usually if you can, if you can write code that's clean and well factored uh, and of course well tested, much easier to then go back and apply optimizations later. Um, but you do have to use your judgment that, yeah, if you're going to have to undo swathes of code and do it a completely different way, uh, that, that's not uh, so good. Um, in the second half of this talk, I'm going to talk about property-based testing. And that's another opportunity where uh, performance um, requirements, um, that it's, it's a good way of working with them. So we'll, I'll defer that for the second half of this talk, I think. But certainly the, the first part of the question, in the, in the green stage, writing just the code to make the test pass, definitely performance is not your concern at that stage. You would hold it on. Would this, um, as a follow-up question for myself, um, 
this also include would be because you said performance isn't a functional requirement. What if it is a functional requirement, right? If it says like we have this much SLA, we have this much time to re perform a request, would you see it as a non-functional requirement at this stage or in general it the uh, formula changes if it is a hard functional requirement? So when I say functional requirement, I mean it's something that you can um, test in the in the code, as in um, testing values and things like that. It's, mm -hmm. it's expressed in the API. So that it's a non-functional requirement. It's still a requirement, mm -hmm. but non-functional in the sense it's not related to the, the functional API. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And the second question was, I always think uh, the TDD approach is good, but doesn't it come with a lot of rework, which increases the overall delivery time? Uh, yes to a point and then no. So <laughs> just to qualify that. Um, yes, it does involve a lot of rework. Mm -hmm. um, the, the trick is, and this is something you don't really fully appreciate until you're doing it. Most of that rework happens very quickly. In fact, a big part of the TDD cycle is that it typically happens very fast. You will often go run a whole TDD cycle in seconds, um, you know, maybe minutes, um, you know, depending on factors like compile times, which of course in C++ could be more of a factor, but there are techniques that we probably won't get into that can help there. Um, but that's what you're aiming for. You're aiming for very quick cycles. So yeah, you might code things up one way and then change it, but that happens in seconds. But the the longer arcs where you, you get from you know having nothing to having something working, um, once you are proficient and you get into the ebb and flow, will very often happen faster than you might have done if you were just hacking away um, the, the way that we might traditionally do. Not always, and sometimes it does take a bit longer. And sometimes the payoff comes later still when you're not spending more time uh, fixing bugs in production and that sort of thing. Uh, so sometimes the payoff will come sooner, sometimes it comes later, but it's, um, it's not the case that all this writing it one way and then immediately changing it adds a lot of overhead. Um, it doesn't, and typically it will save time in the long run. Okay, thank you. I think that's it for, that's it for now. Um, okay, great. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll pull some questions again at the end of, of this uh, uh, section before we uh, have the break, but I'm going to move on and I've sort of actually partially covered this already because I, I did say that, yeah, learning the TDD cycle, very easy, it's just one slide. You can walk through it in a few minutes and we did. Uh, but I also went a little bit further and I, I did point out there are some parts where you have to apply the, the art of TDD and use your existing knowledge and experience and also gain more experience with TDD itself. So that's a part of it, but there's actually even more to it than that. It's just worth talking about this for a moment. The trouble with TDD, um, and it's something that uh, derails a lot of people when they start their TDD journey. And as I just said, it's hard to learn the art because it's often not really explained up front by um, uh, books or uh, pe people trying to teach it. They concentrate on the, oh yeah, it's just simple, you just do this and you get this benefit. But no, there's, there's actually more to it than that. And it does require experience, which means you're not going to become proficient immediately. You're going to have to gain that experience. As a consequence, your productivity will go down at the start. I do believe, and it's been my experience and many others, that it comes back up to much greater than it was before. But that takes time. But the worst part is, many people, most people maybe, once they learn TDD and they wake up from the matrix to say, I know TDD, they go back to their day job and their production code and start trying to practice what they've learned, because it must be good. And then they hit the above, above problems. They're not proficient yet, productivity goes down, and the realities of you know day-to-day -day pressures, uh, deadlines and um, colleagues asking what you're doing and um, things not quite working out the way they do in the books, all those things add up and very quickly you're giving up. They're thinking, yeah, it doesn't really work, or it doesn't work for me, or it doesn't work in my job. You hear that a lot, and this is usually the reason why, because you can't just take these things and practice them straight away 
in a real world environment, typically. Uh, or, or if you do, you have to be prepared to, uh, to uh, put up with all of that for a long time, and most of us can't. So if that's the problem, the solution should be clear. Don't do that. Instead, practice your new TDD skills in a separate safe to fail environment. And that means setting aside some time that we all need to do for our own personal development as, as software developers to, to practice this new skill. And we typically call that deliberate practice. And deliberate practice is not specific to TDD or even software development, although we do refer to it a lot. But I mean, as the, the picture uh, well illustrates, it um, includes things like martial arts, but also um, learning a musical instrument or a foreign language or any skill that you can improve by repetitive practice. And so it goes back thousands of years and it's, it's very well, well known and the whole um, like 10,000 hours thing is all based around this. Deliberate practice is a setting aside a time to repetitively practice something. And some people do point out that this is not quite what we mean when we, when we apply this to uh, software development skills, because we usually practice some particular problem, some little problem we can work through. What we're aiming for is not to get really good at solving that particular problem. We don't want to become world experts at FizzBuzz, for example. That's not the intended outcome. The intended outcome is to use that as a vehicle to practice some other skill, whether it's learning a new programming language or a new technology, or in this case, learning TDD. So you're practicing and practicing on maybe different examples to improve your skills at CDD. That's what you, we need to be able to do, to set aside time for deliberate practice, to hone our skills, get them to a point where they're ready to let loose on the world. And even then, still expect a little bit of a dip in productivity, but hopefully you'll, you'll get back up quickly enough that it won't be a problem. So with that set up, that's what we're gonna do now. We're gonna go through a coding kata, as they're called, it all comes from Japanese, of course. And the one that um, I'm gonna use is snakes and ladders. So here is a snakes and ladders board that my, my kids used to use. I think we still got it somewhere. Took this photo a few years ago. Uh, it's a bit easier to see it from the top down. And I picked this because I think, um, well, it's, it's fun to try and model a game. And it's a simple enough one that we can do it in a short period of time. And it's fairly universally known. I know um, some parts of the world have some different names. I think they call it something different in the, in the US, for example. But pretty much everyone will recognize this. Um, I'm sure we all remember the, the gameplay as well. But let's just talk that through in terms of software requirements. So we have a board here. It's got a 100 squares arranged in a grid of 10 by 10. Now, the grid of 10 by 10 is really sort of a UI or a presentation element. And we're not going to get onto UI. Um, we'll leave that as an exercise. So all that really matters is that it's a series of 10 squares or cells numbered from one to 100. And each set, uh, square can be either an empty square with just a number, or it's the bottom of a ladder or the head of a snake. And if it's one of those two things, it acts like a portal that will transport you to another part of the board. So generically, you can think of them as portals, or I'm sure you can come up with another term. That's the one that I use. And again, whether it's a snake or a ladder, it's mostly about presentation. And it also gives you a hint at which direction you're going to go in. But apart from that, that's pretty much it. That's how you model the board. In terms of gameplay, uh, players have different colors. They'll start on square one, take it in turns to roll a die. So a random number between one and six, move that number of squares. Whatever square they land on, if it's an empty square, they stay there. If it's the start of one of these portals, they get transported to the other end. That's it. The winner is the first player to land exactly on square 100. So if you're in one of the, the last few squares and you roll a number that's too high, you miss your go. So if you're on square 97 and you roll a, a five, you miss your go. And that's pretty much it. That's the entire game. Um, when my kids used to play this, they were young enough that they didn't quite realize that it was purely a game of chance, uh, but that works in our favor. We don't have to um, add too much um, inter interactivity. 
So how are we going to start this? Let's um, let's actually model the board. So really, each of these portals is just three pieces of information. We've got the start square, the target square, and whether it's a snake or a ladder, assuming that matters. So the first one from two to 38, we can capture that out. There's another one there from four to 14. We can capture that out. We're just gonna go through these one by one. Actually, no, we can we can shortcut that, go straight to the end. Here's all the snakes and the ladders, just uh, captured out in that format. So pure information, pure data, but not too much to change that into some code already. This is sort of almost legal C++. We just need to put that into a map. So I'm gonna make it a map of uh, uint32t to something that I'm gonna call a portal, which is um, a struct, which has an enum to say if it's a snake or a ladder, and another uint32t, which is the target, the destination, if you like. And, and that's it, that's, that's our model of the board. And a note that we, we wrote all of that code at least on the slide, without writing any tests. So we're not using TDD to do this bit. And the reason I think that's okay is because this is essentially declarative code. We are just capturing the model uh, in, in code. Now, of course, you, you could test whether it actually captures the model, but that would require having to have a, another version of the model somewhere else that we test against. That may be necessary. Um, I think for our purposes here, this, this is fine. So yeah, th th there may be some tests you can write against this, but actually testing the mechanics of it, what we can really do is test that map works. And I think that's a job for the standard library implementers, not us. So I think we can assume map works. So I think it's a good starting point. And with that, we're going to drop to real code. So I'm gonna do a uh, demo now in C-Line. So this is C-Line, and I've already got that code loaded up here, exactly as we saw. Um, now I could just write main here, and I could actually start writing a test already, just by using assert. And I could say, perhaps, what happens if we look in portals with index two, get the target out, and check that it's 38. And if I've done that right, yeah, that compiles, I can run it. And in fact, I think I can uh, add a, a catch target in C line. And oh, okay, that's fun. Um, not quite sure why that didn't work. Always works when you uh, when you're trying out before. And let's stick to the uh, to the console runner then. Or maybe there's something else going on because that's not doing anything at all. Obviously, didn't pray hard enough to the demo gods. Ah, I didn't add the original target back in. There we go. All right, we'll stick with this. So. Oh, I know. Yeah, I'm jumping ahead. We haven't actually got catch in yet. <laughs> uh, ignore me. We were just demonstrating assert. Uh, you can actually use that as a, um, a very basic test framework. If we make it fail, say uh, compare that to zero, we get yeah, assertion failed, uh, prints out the original expression that we wrote, even tells us it was in function main. So if you put it in a different function, you can use the function name as a type of uh, test name and tells you the file, file and line number that it failed on. It's actually not bad. If that's all you've got, no dependencies, it's pretty good. Unfortunately, most of this is platform dependent. Um, you'll usually get something like this. You won't always get the function name. You'll usually get the file and line number, um, but it's not too bad. Uh, the trouble is, well, it's not telling us what target actually returned. And if I was to do something more like this, because um, square one is a an empty square, so we would expect that to give us back square one. Yeah, it doesn't tell us what it returned. You have to sort of really know how 
uh, stood map works to know that when you use a square brackets indexer for an entry that's not there and actually create it for you and default initialize, uh, at least in debug mode, typically, the, the value. So that's going to return a zero, which if we'd seen the output, maybe we'd have got sooner. In any case, this is not actually a good test because as I said, it's not up to us to be testing that map works, but that's all we're doing here. What we really need to do is raise the level of abstraction. So let's do two things at once. First of all, we're going to introduce catch instead of using assert. So let's hash include uh, catch.hpp and an exactly one source file. You'll be familiar with this if you've used catch before. We have to do catch config main. If you're not familiar with catch, catch is a single header test framework. Um, and in order for it to compile its implementation and give us a version of main, uh, we, we do that hash define in exactly one translation unit. Everywhere else we just include catch.hpp. And then we don't need main anymore, but we can make that a test case. Uh, I'm not going to give it a name for now. And I'll just change assert to require. And that should build, build, and run. Now we've got our failure. Now we can see, yeah, we've got that zero back because we've got that default initialized entry. That's a bit clearer, that's a bit more useful. And this is one of the reasons we use a test framework. We've got a bit more color, which can be useful, We've got more information. Um, we didn't give it a test name, but it's given us one anyway, but if we put one in, that will be there. Uh, lots of benefits if you can see a test framework. I'm not gonna go into that in depth here now. Hopefully you're convinced of that. Um, you notice that it took a little while for that to build. Uh, remember I said the TDD cycle should be very fast. Anything that's going to take a long time is going to disrupt your flow. And yeah, it only took, what, 10, 15 seconds, maybe. That's enough to actually d disrupt you. And sometimes that's going to be unavoidable. But if you can get it down to just a few seconds at most, then you're going to, the TDD cycle is going to be much more effective. So with catch, the reason is because we did this here, it's, it's basically compiling the whole of the catch library every time. So the solution is to add a new source file. I'll call this tests.cpp. And what I'm going to do is basically copy everything we had into there. So this is exactly what we just had, except I'm going to take out hash if I catch config main. And I'm back in main.cpp. I'm going to remove everything except those two lines. So the library is going to get compiled into this translation unit, and then incrementally we're going to avoid compiling that the next time. So first time we build, that will take now 10 to 15 seconds. There we go. Now in here, if I change that, much faster. That's much better. That's uh, not going to disrupt our flow now. All right, so we're set up with catch. Oh, well, now I can show you <laughs> that um, integration with C line, just out of interest. See how that works. Now, if I run it, we get a nice test runner. We have a hierarchical view here. And um, because there's only one test, it's not really showing us that much. But So let's go back and address this test. I said it's not a very good test because we're just testing that map works. What we want to do is raise the level, level of abstraction. So probably what we want is some sort of bold object. And we want to know what happens when we land on a certain square. So let's say when we land on square one, we'll go to one. Now, of course, that won't compile. So if I build that, plenty of errors, as we would expect, because we don't have a board, 
don't have this method. We only have the class the board is an instance of. So let's take a step back. Start there. So we need a board. Um, I should just point out that C line should be telling me this doesn't exist. And this message up here is telling me that it thinks that that's not in the project. So I might just need to reload the CMake project, sort that out. That's still not. Again, uh, this always works, <laughs> except when I'm demoing it. All right. Maybe that will just start working a bit later. The important thing is the compiler can tell us that we don't have a board class. So let's write one. Simplest thing to make the test pass. In this case, the test is the compiler, as we said. That now builds. Don't know how that got in a separate line. So we are green. No code running, but we are green. Now we can look at the next line, our runtime test. Again, it doesn't compile because we don't have a land on method. So let's add that. So we know we want it to return the, the square that we land on, or the square that we go to, should I say. And we're going to take a square. Um, and we're probably not going to change anything, so by default I'm going to make it const. Okay, now what do we return? Because we could, but it's very tempting. So look, I know, look, we've got a one coming in. We want to test it against one. I can make it pass. I can just return square. Or even, I can just return one. That would be simple, right? But remember, this is, this is now a new test. We've got it compiling. That was one time around the cycle or at least it will be, but we want the next test to fail to give us another time around the cycle. So let's return the wrong answer. If I build, that compiles, we're green. Now if I run, we are red again. For expected reasons, we knew this was going to happen. Well, we expected this was going to happen. Sometimes your assumptions won't hold. And you'll expect it to fail and it won't. Or maybe it will fail in a different way. And that's also useful information that we would have missed otherwise. So now we make it pass. Again, the simplest thing to make it pass is to change our 0 to a 1. Again, very counterintuitive the first time you see this. Or maybe even the second time you see it. But we're now green again. Here's the reason we do that. So first of all, we return to zero the first time so that we could see the test failing and then change to green, start passing, specifically because of the change that we made. No assumptions, we saw it happen. Now, we're returning a one to make it pass again, but that forces us to write another test to get it to fail again. So. Let's take the next empty square, which would be uh, free. So now it compiles again, but of course it fails. Now we can generalize because now we have more than one test covering it. That's the secret. If I jump straight to returning square, then, well, our single test would have been passing, there would have been no pressure on us to add another test. We may have wanted to anyway, but this requires it. And sometimes it's not so obvious. So that test forced the generalization. Okay. But we haven't actually looked at any of the snake cell adders yet, so let's now do square 2, which was a ladder to square 38. put that in and of course we expect that to fail it does all right now we finally only at this point even need to consider the portals 
which are currently sitting outside of the struct. So I'm going to move them in because I think they wholly belong to the board to uh, make it a high level of abstraction. I'm going to change it to a class now so we can have some private state. Make that public. Now we can't quite do it like this. We need to, um, well I'm going to make it static const first and then I'm going to copy that outside the class. So I'm going to put it after the test as well for reasons I hope it will become clear in a moment. Just need to fix this up. Just a lot of coding here but it's all tedious boilerplate C++ stuff that is all a bit boring. Um, so now I've moved the portals out of the class. Sorry, they're in the class. They are defined outside the class as a static const member. And everything still runs as we'd expect. Let's actually, sorry, back that out. So we go back to green, sorry, jumped ahead. Yeah, so we're still green. We haven't got to that yet. Um, because we haven't actually changed any functionality, we just moved that inside, that was a refactoring. Now we can refer to it in here. So, um, we can say, because we don't need square brackets, because that's going to add the empty squares. So we'll get the iterator out. Uh, if that's not end, so it actually exists. Okay, we'll return. Target. Um, I've done it the wrong way around. I'm always doing that. There we go. Yep. And we can put our test back. And now we're green. We are finding our portals, and if not, we're falling back to returning square. All good. Just for uh, completeness, let's look at the first snake, 47 to 26. Put that in as well. So because there's no real difference between a snake or a ladder, we expect that to pass first time, and it does. So that's not really a TDD test we just wrote there. Uh, it's what I call a confidence test. And it's okay to do these from time to time because what we're really doing with the TDD tests is we are writing tests about the boundary conditions, the one, at least the ones that we know about, the ones that we thought about up front. We're probing at those boundaries, what I call the contours of the design. But when we do that, we sometimes think, yeah, but what about to just pass that boundary? What about that one or the next one along? Just, just to be doubly sure that I'm testing what I think I am. It's okay to put a few of these little tests in that we expect to pass first time. And of course, if, if they don't, then our assumptions are broken. But we don't want to be doing too many of them. Because if you think about it, I mean, we can pass uh, so many hundreds of thousands of integers or millions of integers here. We're not going to be able to test that whole range or even any uh, representative part of it. So it's not really a, a winning strategy strategy to actually start going down that route. Once you've done a couple of confidence tests, there's got to be a better way to get further. And we'll look at that in the, the second half. So what's the next interesting test that we can write? We've got a, an empty square, we've got a snake, we've got a ladder. Um, next one has got to be the, the winning square which is not here. Oh, yeah. Sorry, jumping ahead. The winning square is, of course, square 100. Now, interesting question. What should that return? And well, obviously, we'd, we know that currently it just returns 100 because it's an empty square, which doesn't really, you know, impart any particular meaning to square 100. But Whose responsibility is it to know that that's the winning square? If the board object 
is encapsulating what the encapsulating what the board is. It's encapsulating with the portals. It should know what the size of the board is and what the winning square is. So really, it should be the board's responsibility. So, as with a lot of these things, there's there's many ways to do it. But I would say that Landon should probably return us a richer type that can also distinguish between winning moves and just a normal move. So let's add such a type. Well, actually, let's write what we want it to, to return. I'm going to say I want it to return an action with a an action type of win. Something like that. But obviously it's not going to compile for now, so I'm going to comment out for a minute. We'll add this just as a refactoring step. Now, as it happens, just by coincidence, it looks very similar to Portal, because I've done this before, but so that's just coincidence. So action, it's got an enum called type, which is either move or win. That's the state that we want. And then it has a target. That's why I say it's very similar to Portal. So I've just taken advantage of that to save us a bit of time. Now we want Landon to return that. And that means here we've got to return action type move, because that's what we've been doing so far for both of these. There we go. And it also means, unfortunately, we have to change our tests. Now, the simplest thing that will get us back to green, because that's what we're aiming for here, for the moment at least, is just to consider the target, because that's the same behavior that we already had. And run that. So we've commented out our last test. We're back to green. But now we have the ability to return uh, this action type. I just want to talk for a moment about this change we made here, because we, we could replace this with checking the action with the action type as move, and that's really what we should be doing. I'm going to skip that for now, for the sake of time, So I think we're actually running a bit short and I've got a bit more to get through. So just leave that as an exercise, and we'll come on to how we're going to make this work. Now, there's a couple of problems here. One is that uh, we haven't actually supplied the, the target. And that's a problem because we don't actually want to. If it's a win, we don't actually need to know what the target was. And it's a bit of a weakness in C++ as a language. We don't have, at least at the language level, what we call a, uh, a sum type or a, a discriminated union or a tagged union. We really want to say, well, if it's a move, we have a target. If it's a win, we don't. We could do that with a uh, stood variant. Uh, and it, you know, it could be an interesting exercise to see how that works out. But I think that's probably a little bit heavy weight of solution for this problem. So I'm just going to live with the fact that we have to also specify the target for now. You may make a different choice. Which means we have to put 100 there. So now that should compile, except it doesn't because unfortunately we don't have C++ 20 yet, at least I don't here. So it hasn't given us a, an equality operator by default. Fortunately, because I have C line, I can, I should be able to generate it. Unfortunately, nothing seems to be working today. Ah, oh, it's because it's still got that problem. Okay, <laughs> normally it would generate it for me. I'm gonna have to write it out myself. Um, what am I doing? That's it. It's been so long since I've written one of these, you see.
I get that right? Nope. Ah. Of course. Yep, really is true that I haven't written one of those for a while. Okay, horribly inconsistent, I know, but that should do the job. And let us run that. See it fail with not very much information, unfortunately, because uh, we don't have anything that can convert that to a string for us. Save a bit of time. I'm going to grab some code that I prepared earlier. Very, again, boring, straightforward, but tedious code to uh, two things actually to effectively serialize the action itself. Let's change that. And to serialize the enum type. Um, obviously, if we add any more enum types, this will throw an exception. We, we need to keep that maintained. Now, you can do this sort of thing just in test code if you don't actually need it in production code because it's really just to aid testability. So now we can actually see what it is we're dealing with. That's what we expect. So coming back down here, uh, too far. We need to get this to detect the win, which I can do here. Um, like so. Run that and we are green again. At this point, we can have a look and I haven't really been consciously considering the refactor step. So that's my bad. But we should definitely do it here because we have this magic number. Now 100 is there because we said that this should really be a property of the board. So let's actually make it that. Call it size. And we'll make it another static const member. Like so. everything still works. So successful refactor. Now at this point, there's a, there's a few more things that I want to do. I'm actually going to skip ahead because um, I need to be wrapping this up, this section up quite soon. So I'm just going to talk through it. The next stage is going to be to um, consider square 80, which is one of the reasons I like this board. It's the ladder to square 100, which means it's also the winning move. And it's interesting because to make that work here, we have to do this mapping first. But we're currently returning out of here, which means we've got to make quite a few little changes here before we can move this down to the bottom and, and do this uh, check after the mapping. And then it all works. And it leads us on to some fun things like um, immediately invoke lambda expressions can be a nice tool there. Uh, and we end up with a, a land-on method or, uh, that boils down to just two switches. One, using an immediately lam invoked lambda expression to map the input variable to an intermediate representation. And the second one just maps the intermediate representation to the enriched output type. I'm going to skip that and jump straight to summing this up. And what I, what I really want to say is uh, we will have, because we'll still need to consider one past the end. So we'll have two more tests, which is one, two, three, four, five, seven. If we had another confidence test, let's call it eight. And that's pretty much it. Eight tests. And two of those are confidence tests. So six tests, really. It just doesn't feel like it's enough. You know, we, we've got this guilt complex almost about testing that we need to write more tests and you know, how often have you said yeah I wrote exactly as many tests as we needed we always feel like we should be writing more when you're doing TDD it's not that you shouldn't be writing more tests but by making that distinction between which tests are probing at those boundaries the ones that you you know about that tease out that the contours of your design and which ones are just there to give you extra confidence by making that separation actually 
we end up writing fewer tests, but those tests are more targeted. We then also need some other techniques for probing at the, the, the boundaries that we hadn't thought of. And we'll, we'll talk about that in the second half. But I need to come back out of here now. Um, back to here. And in fact, yeah, that was my final slide for, for this section. Um, I'm going to just see if there's any more questions. I'm sure there's been a few firing off uh, before we actually break. Yes, there have been many questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> indeed, uh, there are seven questions I want to ask you. So um, I suggest you make the answers a bit smaller and especially if there's an after talk chat, right? So everyone that wants to have a more detailed in-depth discussion with Phil, mm -hmm. feel free to hang out um, afterwards. And yeah, of course. Uh, I'm sure that's uh, gonna cover all of it. And let's start, let's get going. Okay. Um, hi, Phil, what is your view in C++, the usage of private class methods and uh, so untestable? Right? Fortunately, I cover that in the second half. So I'll okay. prefer that one. That's perfect. That's that's a very quick answer. I like it. Yep. <laughs> um, hi, Phil. You mentioned Catch2 as your favorite test framework. I wonder why. <laughs> um, <laughs> did, you have the, did you have the opportunity to look at newer frameworks like DocTest or Boost uh, UT? Uh, yes and yes. So main reason I like Catch2 is because I originally wrote it. Um, I should qualify that by saying I haven't really been, well, I haven't been the main maintainer for the last year or two. Um, in fact, I've barely been a maintainer at all for the last year. Uh, I'm still still contributing stuff occasionally. Uh, but yeah, I originally wrote it. Uh, and I wrote it specifically to be lightweight, easy to embed in other projects, um, and sort of low ceremony. So I, whether I wrote it or not, I think it's ideal for using these sorts of examples, because really you just include the header and, and you go, at least when you remember to do it in the right order. Um, so. In terms of other frameworks that I've have, have I considered them? Um, what were the two that you mentioned again? Was it? Um, There's like three. That's a follow up question. Next one: uh, Doc Test, Boost UT, and yeah. G Test, Google Test. Okay, yeah. So, very quickly, just take those. Uh, in fact, in, in my two day training course, I have a whole section on different test frameworks, and I mention all of those uh, as good frameworks, as it happens. Now, Doc Test is is heavily inspired by Catch, very Catch like. Um, not as feature rich, but it has one, well, I suppose one or two um, main um, objectives that uh, everything else stems from. And that is fast compile times and to a lesser extent, um, fast runtimes. Uh, but fast compile times in particular. So, I mean, you saw that we had to do that extra step to, to make sure our in incremental compile times were, were reasonable. When you get lots of tests, that can still be a bit longer than, than some people like. Um, and so they, they do prefer the uh, lower compile time overhead of doc test. Um, but in particular, doc test, uh, but where the name comes from, is that um, the idea is that you write, you can, well, at least you can write tests in your production code rather than having these separate test projects, which is the way I like to work. Write it straight in your production code because it doesn't really add much extra compile time overhead uh, and maybe even leave them compiled in optionally um, so if you like working that way doc test is really good uh, or if you find that catch compile times are too long for you give doc test a look got a lot of respect for that framework um, but I, at this point at least catch and catch two still have more features so that that may be a reason to to stick with with that uh, boost experiment to ut is interesting in a completely different way. I would say it's not really ready yet for it to be used seriously day to day. It's um, it, there's a reason the word experimental is in there. Um, mm -hmm. It's more like what would the next generation test framework look like, given all of C plus plus twenties features. So it's heavily reliant on C plus plus twenty. Um, you'd be very hard pressed to actually get anything to compile it just yet. Um, we, we may have crossed that bar by now. Um, but it lets you do things like um, 
make full use of all the frameworks and facilities with no macros, which is quite nice. Um, I'm not entirely sure that's totally necessary, but it's really nice to be able to do it. Um, beyond that, there's not a great deal of advantage. It's just a nicer, more modern framework. So we'll, we'll see where that goes. I'm really interested in it. Um, again, huge respect for uh, uh, for Chris who uh, who wrote it, Chris Kusiak, um and what he's done with it. But so not quite ready for prime time yet. So I think um, catch is going to be uh, relevant for for a while yet. Uh, on Google Test. Um, deserves a mention as the most popular test framework. Um, according to the, the JetBrains ecosystem report, it's about uh, two mm -hmm. or three times uh, more popular or more widely used than Catch, but then Catch is second. <laughs> so, um, you know, so that's not doing too bad. Ca uh, Google Test has a couple of features that Catch doesn't. For some people, these are showstoppers, so um, that can be important. Uh, one of them is Dev Tests, which is basically lets you um, check whether something terminates your program, which it does by spawning a separate process and running the test there, checks the exit value. Uh, Catch doesn't do that yet, although I've got some code on a um, local repo somewhere that, uh, that does actually do that. It's just not quite ready to, to submit yet, uh, but that hopefully will come at some point. Uh, similarly with um, multi-threading support, very often asked, can you use catch in a multi-threaded environment? Uh, I mean, to some extent you can. What you can't do is do it, do asserts on different threads concurrently. There's no synchronization in the framework to, to allow that to happen. Um, mostly because it was first written in C++03. Um, and it was one of the things that we wanted to move it to C++11 for to, to get uh, stood thread support. We just haven't got around to it yet. Again, it's just a matter of time. Uh, but there, there are two Two big reasons that a lot of people choose Google Test over Catch. I've already spent yeah, a bit longer than I expected well. on that question. But. Yeah, that, those are amazing answers. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, but the next one is, is there a way to use Catch to test constants, constant expressions at compile time? Uh, yes and no. It's, it's a very broad mm -hmm. question. I mean, you certainly can, but probably not in the way that you mean. It doesn't have specific compile time um, testing support in it. And there's more than one way to do that, or at least more than one approach needed. Um, some things have been considered um, that may have even gone in since I last looked, actually. So, so I'm not the day-to-day -day maintainer anymore. Um, I have a feeling that that's been, some work has been discussed there, but I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what that is. And in fact, again, uh, you have a resident expert um, on the, MUC++ team, uh, Roland Bock, I know has done a lot more thinking about this side of things. So um, mm. definitely uh, catch him to ask about that. But in terms of catch support, nothing specific um, right now, or, or if there is, there may be something that's gone in just recently. You'll have to actually check that yourself. Okay. Um, the next one is, um, it's a bit longer. The trick with a separate file that speeds up the compilation is awesome. Do you have any suggestions on how to automate the compile and run unit test cycle too. In the JavaScript world, for example, it's very common to have a test runner spinning in the console, monitoring the project directory, and rerunning the tests whenever something changes. I'm just curious if you've tried that for C++ and if it worked out for you. The, the trouble is, um, obviously, C++ is not JavaScript. Um, although I've seen this for um, uh, .NET languages as well. I'm not saying it's impossible. But there are many more hurdles because you've got to compile it first and then run the test. Uh, it can all be done, but because compile times and the the um, CPU overhead of doing it, um, I'm not sure that it would actually be worth it because it would have to be a full compile. You can't do what, for example, C line does to give you the uh, the warnings and, and errors before you even compile. It's it's effectively doing a partial compile constantly, exactly that same principle. But it only has to do a partial compile, not an absolutely full compile. Of course, if it was constantly compiling, maybe that would actually speed up the builds. But I'm, I'm not aware of any infrastructure to make that happen at the moment. M maybe it has, but I think we're a way off being able to do that. Um, what you can do is you can um, incorporate running the tests into your um, build system, build scripts whatever it is you're working with. For example, if you're using CMake, you can use CTest to kick test off. So every time you actually do the build, 
it will run the test as part of the build process. Maybe that gets you halfway to where you are, but if you're using an IDE, I don't think it's that big a deal to just compile and run, other than, of course, the time you spend waiting for it, which which you could have paralyzed. But again, because the, the TDD cycle is generally very fast, I'm not sure you'll get much benefit most of the time. Probably not okay. the answer you're hoping for. As always, um, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's a very interesting topic and uh, I'm personally also curious to ask some more questions for this, but uh, of course we'll do so later in the yeah. after talk. Um, this one's a bit more open, right? Um, who defines the tests and what uh, percentage of code coverage and, and what, what percentage is the code coverage of those tests? So what was the first part? Who defines the test, did you say? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not sure what that means, but... So my, my best guess at what is meant, so whoever's asking this, if I've got this wrong, um, I'll ask again, but uh, my best guess at what was meant there is, at the start, when, when I say write a failing test, who actually comes up with what the test should be? And of course, the answer to any software engineering problem is it depends, but maybe slightly more usefully, um, and it is it is the same programmer that's that's writing the code. So if you've been given a um, a task to do, then you've got a, an idea of what the requirements are. And if you haven't, you obviously need to do some exploratory coding to work that out. But at some point you think, right, this is what we need to do. So either you wrote, write the code and then verify it somehow, either manually or by writing an automated test then, or you just do it up front. If you do it up front, exactly the same, but you're encoding your expected outcome before you write the the code to make it pass, and it's it's a different, as I say, it's a different frame of mind, which we'll, we'll come on to in the second half. You're in this sort of um, requirements oriented frame of mind before you go down to the code level. So it's actually a bit easier to do it that way once you get into the uh, into the routine. Uh, maybe we'll revisit that point when. I talk about that in the second half, and I'll give the asker the question time to say whether I've completely got the wrong end of the stick. So I'll mm -hmm. defer that for now. Mm, there's one more question, the last one, and then there's the break for everyone. Um, you mentioned that a typical cycle is a few minutes or seconds. Um, how often would you typically commit to source control? I do cover that again in the second half, but mm -hmm. personally, um, I don't always commit every time round. Um, part of that is because I'm using C line it has a feature called local history, which does it for me, not into version control, but into this local sort of local history, sort of in memory repo. It's not even in memory, but it's, it's all automatic. So every time you compile or test or refactor, you get a, like this, uh, commit in like an undo history. So. I've got all the, the the small ones done for me, so I only really commit when I've got something um, a bit more substantial that I think, yeah, this is something I want to make sure is preserved. But uh, I'll, we'll come back on that a little bit in the second half as well. Excellent. All right. Um, I think it's a well-deserved break for everyone.